Hi, my name is Tim Schep. I work at the Setup Media Lab here in Utrecht, the Netherlands. Um, today we're talking to Saskia Sassen and her new book, Expulsions. We created a number of video snippets that you can enjoy on this website. And before we go, I would like to very much thank uh, all our partners like Hacking Habitat and our sponsors like the Gemeente Utrecht and the Stimuleringsfonds Creatieve Industry. Thank you guys so much. Here we go. I'm sitting here with Saskia Sassen and we're talking about her latest book. So you mentioned complexities. Yeah. Your book is Expulsions, it's about complexities and, and, and how can you, can you tell us a little bit about it? Right. Well, one, one of the sort of vectors that organizes the book is this notion that complex forms of knowledge that we really admire and respect, and we should admire and respect them, wind up being deployed by actors or enterprises that that produce very simple brutalities, not grand brutality. So when you build a dam, a big dam, that's an enormously complex operation with multiple forms of knowledge. And by God, the results are grand. You flood over whole forests and villages, you know, massive. So the whole thing has a visual order that captures the complexity of the intervention and the enormous complexity of the destruction. And I, what I was interested in tracking here was kind of disconnect, you know, say in finance, you know, algorithmic math, not microeconomics math. Microeconomics is child's play compared to this because, because it's closed, you know, so you just have to manipulate some variables. When, with algorithmic, you know, it, it really matters what you put in there. What are the assumptions? What are the questions? Right. So it sort of opens it up, you know, and and so in in the case of high finance, it's uh, they have like a, where they first had a hundred secretaries, today they have a hundred physicists, right? Yeah, you know, doing this stuff, and developing, but Pretty then the black boxes that are yeah the the outcome in so much of what finance does is sort of often a very elementary and brutal operation um, that is highly destructive, but you know, in, in, through a whole set of intermediation sometimes. And that sort of struck me. And, and um, the same thing, say, with fracking. Fracking is a very complex form of knowledge. You know, you have to get a lot mm -hmm. of things right. And what are we left with? Just a devastation. You know, it, it seems to me that that and and it's not like the dam when the dam starts working you have the drama a visual drama that right. unfolds and and here no here it's an invisible set of but over time you know 10 years later you discover or very indirect tremors like in Honingen right yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. that it, or or in the UK where we now have little earthquakes in areas where you, you know these are sort of highly intermediated and it's just a different and and that also means that a lot of these destructions become a bit invisible, you know, either right. because they are whatever or because they're highly intermediated. And, and so this, this invisibility is something that you really notice, and, and you see it happening uh, from your book in, from the 80s onwards. There seems to be kind of a shift in your. You see something happening. What well, can you explain right. a bit about from, what do you see happening? There? Right. Well, from the 80s onwards, what I argue is that there is a kind of new ordering. It does not mean that everything changes. It just means that there are critical new elements in play that operate directly and indirectly in a variety of domains. So when I argue that, um, you know, I ask sort of a rhetorical question, what is the steam engine of our epoch? And I usually like to leave a minute of silence because then I assume that people immediately go to what is not these beautiful bells tolling, <laughs> but the self-evident thing, which is information technology. And then I say, no. Information technology is kind of by now infrastructural element. It's everywhere, literally, mm -hmm. you know. Whereas I argue there is a kind of a new ordering that is set up by high finance, which is directly and indirectly present in critical situations, but not everywhere. And so I, I talk about um, high finance as a as something that is not banking. But they are related, aren't they? Like technology and high finance. Being oh yes, possible. they are very related. Yeah. That is what I mean. 
this form of high finance could not operate. It's infrastructural. Yeah. But the logic of high finance cannot be reduced to the logic yeah. of digital domains. You know, though, though finance uses those capabilities and, of course, the logics through which you yeah. can use them. But finance itself is about something else. Yeah. It's not about the technology. I distinctly remember um, one of your first lectures that I saw oh. where you mentioned um, how you thought that in the creative industries, everyone always thinks about artists and, and said, no, the, the real creative people are the financers <laughs> who create these new methods of tr transmitting cash to certain parts of the world when there's enough demand. That, that's really... <laughs> Nice, because nobody ever thinks about accountants as creative. Well, in your yeah. view, accountants oh yeah, creative are accounting. Creative. Yeah, this, this is a kind of accounting that is truly extraordinarily creative. Yeah. But um, but so so so, you know, for me, a critical distinction that is often not made is that finance is not traditional banking. The traditional bank sells something it has, money. Finance sells something it does not have. And in that selling, what it does not have lies its danger and its creativity, you know? So it has to invent instruments, which is great. That's where the physicists enter the picture. But it then invades other sectors because it sells something that it does not have. So it needs grist for its mill. So it financializes all kinds of things, very fancy kind of debt. You know, that is the main thing. But then it can also move into very modest, like modest homes, used car loans, student loans, you know, where the aggregation of millions makes it worthwhile. Yeah. But these are very modest assets. But when it has run out all of the, of the big assets, it moves there. So it is truly a dangerous capability because it will then distort, you know. Mm -hmm. It submits everything to its logic, and that has been extremely destructive. And, and in that logic, apparently, people are not as, you, as necessary anymore. To create value, people right? are not as necessary. That's right. Now I want to emphasize that we still have the consumer economy. We we have all these Keynesian elements, you know, large scale, right. etc. The issue is that the, my question is, what has the capacity to establish a new ordering? After World War II, the consumer sectors mm -hmm. they had that capacity, and it was the, the critical link was that we, the workers should also have the capacity to be consumers of cars, dishwashers, of everything. Right? Mm -hmm. And so you had a nice logic that led to, okay, the more consumers we have, the better, hence the more workers we have, semi-closed. So it actually worked, no matter its discriminations, its brutalities, yeah. its injustices. Relatively, a lot of people were happy with it. Exactly. Yeah. And states were actors in that. They had to protect the economies. They had to enable, you know, whatever. And so states were actually thriving. What we enter, you know, it's an ambiguous time, but I, I, I locate, I say it starts in the late 1980s with Wall Street as ground zero. Mm. Yeah. Japan, the provider of money, old fashioned mm. money, as opposed to a derivative based on an instrument that was in turn, you know, all of those kinds of long chains, right? And London, the ultimate entrepreneur. You have a little money that you want to deposit here in our bank, we take it. Wall Street wouldn't even have accepted or given a minute of attention. Eh? Mm -hmm. So so I see these three global cities, but this is the data for the 80s, eh? because since then we have 100 global cities. But these three marked this new way of thinking uh, productively, so to say. You know, it was a certain kind of production very different from what preceded. So today we still have the consumption bit, but it does not have the power to shape the economy. So in fact, the impoverishment of the middle classes is one of the best indicators. But something has really changed. Yes, we need to consume. I mean, how would we do without consumption, right? We need it. Mm -hmm. But we are not the ones that really matter to the economy. So a lot of workers, they yeah. become unnecessary. They become somehow hidden. And, and and we don't even see them, you know. I mean, I argue that it is conceptually and statistically that they become invisible. And sometimes also invisible because they go, you know, we just don't see them, yeah. you know. But same thing my argument about dead water and dead land. Why go there? Why go to, you know, we have in the United States thousands and thousands and thousands of displaced people living, I mean, they're not displaced as in the international system, they have been thrown out of their homes. Yes. 
uh, living in blue tent cities, just like the international refugee system, most people in the United States don't know that they exist. My very bright students at Columbia University, they don't know that that exists. So they are so material, so many millions of people thrown out of their homes, invisible. You know, and that is sort of what what struck me in, in this current period, the way we're disposing. It truly is an epoch of disposing. Interesting. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned that, that this is all possible because things got a lot more complex. There's a lot of complex system where you really you can't really point to anyone who's responsible for it anymore. That's right. I, I well great that you picked up on that because most people think I'm simply hitting on the rich. I'm not. I think even if we got rid of all the rich, whatever the means that that would entail, you know, I don't want to. Uh, we would still have these predatory formations. I think many of these top, these brilliant professionals, so to say, they are cogs in a complex machine that involves technologies. I mean, the digital revolution is critical here because of the orders of magnitude that you can jump, the complexity of yeah. the the interacting. Hyper, hyper frequency trading, you know, which is automated trading, I mean, which discovers things that the brilliant analysts had not seen because the time issue is so extraordinary so that now you have fancy banks, you know, Morgan, JP Morgan, whatever, uh, complaining and saying this is unfair that the computer seizes an opportunity and in other words, owned by another, you know. Yeah, these, yeah. And, and I think that is in itself a very interesting little datum, you know, that the computer, once you put that animal, that machine in there, it will see opportunities that you, the competition, had not seen. Mm -hmm. You know, and then you feel... But, but it also means a, a, a logic that can really get out of control. This is just one little indication that, that to me is sort of a curiosity almost. Mm -hmm. you know, but,